Welcome to the first part of the first lecture where we're going to be exploring history, history teaching and think about some of the implications for how children learn history. In this lecture I've divided the content up into four sections. I'm going to start by talking about history um, and, and just kind of rehearse some of the key themes and issues that we need to be aware of and we need to have at the forefront of our mind when we think about history as a discipline. Secondly, I'm going to go on and talk about history education and try and say something about the connections between the academic discipline and the school curriculum subject. Thirdly, I'm going to look at um, just kind of drawing some connections between the themes that we talk about in the first two parts of the lecture and the subsequent structure of the rest of the course, the history methods. And then I'm going to say something very practical about the reading for this week and just set you up with some of the activities that I want you to do before you put your weekly post online. So what's history? Well, in order to think about this question, I've just kind of put out there um, a, a variety of different answers. Now, there are more answers and there are different ways you could construct those answers, but this is just to remind us of the breadth of approaches that people adopt to thinking about history. So the first answer to the question, what's history, is it could be the disinterested pursuit of historical knowledge. Um, and Elton and Plum, both writing in the late 1960s, capture this when they talk about the past, which must be studied for its own sake, and to try and understand what happened purely on its own terms. But this stems back to a much older tradition of thinking historically. And this is uh, a quote from Lucian of Samosota, writing in the second century AD. The historian's mind, he said, must be like a mirror, clear, gleaming, bright, accurately centred, displaying the shapes of things just as he received them, free from distortion, false colouring and misrepresentation. So there's this notion somewhere in the tradition of the construction of history as an academic discipline that the historian can be impartial, can be neutral, and somehow we can construct a fairly objective and in some senses truthful account of what happened. So history is almost synonymous with the past, with what happened, and the job of the historian is just to construct a, a more accurate and more truthful version of that history. The second question, or the second answer, sorry, to the question, is slightly different, and it acknowledges that history can be the construction of meaning from the past. So we move away from the idea that history is synonymous, is exactly the same as the past, and we move into the realms of people acknowledging that history is actually a construction. It's the way that people make meaning from the mass of things that happened in the past. So an example of this is the uh, philosopher Grill Parza, who said, what's history but the way in which the spirit of man apprehends events impenetrable to him? unites things when God alone knows whether they belong together, substitutes something comprehensible for what's incomprehensible, imposes his concept of purpose from without. So this is just another way of saying that this is about putting the historian more centrally in the driving seat and saying that what the historian is doing is trying to make connections which are open to argument because only on this reading only God, some kind of omniscient being that sees everything and understands everything, would really understand what factors are connected. So when the historian's constructing their history, then they're, what they're really trying to do is just make sense of a bunch of ideas and information and facts which are largely incomprehensible, in that they can't be fully grasped by one mind, because we'll never know everything and we'll never know all of the underlying connections. So the important thing to grasp there is that it's, it's man-made, it's constructed, it's a fabrication to some, to some extent. And the other important thing to bear in mind there is that it's always from a standpoint. So whereas the first people we looked at um, had this notion that history could be uh, objective and that the historian just reflected back reality, the moment we move into thinking about history as a constructed um, account then we move into the notion of the historian as someone who is constructing something. So we give the historian agency. So the third answer might be, for, for different people, um, history is an inspiration to ourselves and people around us through celebrating the lives of heroes. So here's an example from a textbook in 1820, where the author of the textbook had pulled together a group of uh, characters from history, 
he said to display the advantages, this is to children, of early exertion, of unwearying perseverance, of inflexible integrity, of sustained honour. In short, providing, sorry, proving that virtue alone can lead to all that is great and noble. And more recently, uh, Harlan has expressed a very similar sentiment and has said that we need to start ransacking the past for men and women whose lives exemplify the moral values desired. What's the issue is our ability to find the predecessors we need. So on this reading, history is a vehicle for us to celebrate what's fantastic about the achievements of other people in different periods of time and then to set that up as some kind of, um, some kind of way to celebrate what's great about people and to encourage everyone else to strive to achieve similarly wonderful things. It's a way of learning about the virtues of our fellow citizens and to aspire to develop those virtues in ourselves. A fourth answer to the question, what's history, is it's an insight into how we construct identity and meaning in our lives. And, and to illustrate this, I've chosen a quote from Foucault, who um, was a philosopher and has been very, very influential in the development of social sciences in the latter part of the 20th century and into the 21st century. But one of his methods was largely historical and he talked about genealogical, genealogical work, which is just to kind of excavate what happened in the past and to look at the past through um, a particular kind of critical lens. So what Foucault talks about when he's constructing history is that he wants to demonstrate um, that historical work is a means of making visible a singularity at places where there's a temptation to invoke a historical constant. In other words, to demonstrate to us that there's always something very specific going on in a context, that even things which appear to be going on for, for centuries and are always with us are actually defined by the time um, that we're studying. So he goes on, th this can appear to us as an immediate anthrop anthropological trait or an obviousness which imposes itself uniformly on all but the purpose of history is to show that things weren't as necessary as all that so in other words Foucault who famously looks at social institutions um, who looks at constructed identities such as madness and insanity or he looks at the construction of health or um, sexual diversity and sexual identity he's looking at these things which in any one moment appear like they're natural, the idea of what's a natural family unit, of, of um, what's a dangerous person in society. And yet by looking at this through his genealogical method, which is just a, a historical lens, he's able to kind of reveal how some of these very um, significant ideas which appear hardwired into the way that we operate as people in society are actually historically contingent. And that opens up the possibility of understanding ourselves in different ways and, and understanding how societies could operate differently. So he's very interested in thinking about how individuals are shaped by their society and how that society is shaped by prevailing ideas. Um, and therefore, history is used to almost literally to construct a sense of the individual. So the fifth answer is simply history is politics. Uh, here's a quote from Freeman in the late 19th century where he summed this up by saying history is past politics and politics are present history. So really um, everything we read about in history books is the stuff of politics. Politics is just the current stuff that's going on in society and in the future our current politics will be written as a form of history. Uh, and Black more recently uh, talked about the past serving as a point of reference, helping not only as an apparent explanation of events, but also as a way to frame policies. A sixth answer to the question, it's what's history, is people say it's essential to remember our history. And, and Santayana made a famous um, quip a number of years ago, those who cannot remember the past are condemned to repeat it. And this is uh, kind of repeated endlessly in when people talk about the importance of history, especially history in schools, but history is a general kind of social form of knowledge that everyone should be engaged with. So this notion somehow that it's essential to remember because we can identify lessons from history and we can kind of break out of um, predictable patterns of negative behaviour and we can try and improve society. 
the complete opposite argument is put forward by David Reith, and he argues that sometimes it's essential to forget. So he poses the question, would we live in a better world if instead of believing so strongly in historical remembering as a moral imperative, we would instead choose to forget? The problem with historical memory, says Reef, as exercised by groups, is that it tends to be high on grievance but low on forgiveness. As the great Polish poet Milosz wrote, it's possible that there is no memory except the memory of wounds, and that's the problem. So for Reef, history as a constant remembrance can be a problem for societies and that we need to be much better at selective forgetting so that we're freed from history and we can move on and forge a new history which a new future which isn't bogged down in all of the old travails and worries and and fears and misconceptions and prejudices that have informed our sense of history so whereas Santayana is saying we need to be aware of history so that we can move on and break the cycle uh, Reef says sometimes that means we, we really need to forget about history and just be much more focused on the present and the future. So, as I say, as I said at the beginning, just a number of different possible ways to answer that question: What is history? What's evident is that it's an emotive subject that it's used by a number of different people for a number of different purposes, and that's going on all all around us now. For history teachers, that makes the subject much more exciting. But it also means that well, there's no settled definition of what it is we're doing. So another way to look at the question of what is history is maybe to think about what historians do when they are doing history, when they're constructing historical accounts. So I'm just going to say something briefly about what historians do when they're engaging in history. So the first answer to this question might be to empathise, but at the same time as empathising with people in the past, acknowledge the gap between then and now. So this is caught in a quote by Ginsberg. He said the historian's task is just the opposite of what most of us were taught to believe. He must destroy our full sense of proximity to people of the past because they come from societies very different from our own. The more we discover about these people's mental universes, the more we should be shocked by the cultural distance that separates us from them. Now, someone um, made the observation that the past is a foreign country. Um, and uh, Weinberg has commented that whilst the past is a foreign country, it's not a foreign planet. So there's always this balance here with understanding or trying to understand people in their own context, uh, but constantly remembering that they're not us, they don't think like us. The way they encounter the world, they make, the way they make judgments about the world is different. And so there's a constant intellectual challenge here to strike the right balance between trying to understand people in their context, but understanding that that's very difficult to do because those contexts are so different from ours. So there's a constant challenge and a constant sense of refining what historical empathy is so that we can understand events even in, as one of our early views of history had it, in, the, in their own terms. So the second thing that historians do is obviously that they interrogate evidence. Uh, here's a quote from a book by Zeman and Dobson just looking at um, how historians work with primary evidence. And they say, for Droysen, verifying the authenticity of the source or its exact date is only the first preparatory step. His core interest is to decipher the meaning of utterances from the past, famously stating the essence of historical method is understanding by means of research. So um, this is just a, an illustrative um, quotation just to demonstrate that when we're talking about working with evidence, we're talking about finding evidence, verifying it, working out what it is, where it comes from, uh, how it relates to the context, but then we have to go on and we have to think about, well, what do we understand from that source? So we have to do some creative um, interrogation of the source. And again, that's a very kind of subtle uh, skill that we develop as historians and something which isn't necessarily um, a shared starting point for people when they approach history. So uh, maybe a skill that we would need to work on in the classroom. The third answer to what historians do is uh, that they differentiate between significant and insignificant. And here's an obvious example of that. Significance offers a way of signposting the past, of inserting a scaffolding into the welter of events that permits us to form an interpretation of history without which we cannot locate ourselves in time. So we're just saying that there's so many things happening in any period of time that we have to help the reader 
by making decisions about what's most significant what, and, and then we have to justify the decision we make about why something is significant. So the fourth answer to the question what the historians do is that the, is they construct narratives. Here's an example taken from the introduction to Danto's book looking at the philosophy of history and the construction of narrative and he says narration exemplifies one of the basic ways in which we represent the world and the languages of beginnings and endings of turning points and crises and climaxes is co-implicated with this mode of representation to so great a degree that our image of our own lives must be deeply narrational. I've continued to be absorbed by narrative as a representational form and in the philosophy of history conceived of as the theory of narrative representation. So here um, in, in answer three we were talking about making judgments about what's important but they don't just stand for themselves we have to then construct them into narrative so that there is a flow to our historical account. So um, this is more than telling stories but it is aligned with storytelling to the extent that we have to find a, 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 a way through the information by developing themes, by developing accounts and stories. And so part of what historians do is they develop those themes, they find ways through the information that makes sense to us as humans. And then we use a certain language, turning points, crises, climaxes, beginnings, endings, in order to make sense of that in human terms for our readers. And then the fifth answer is that in doing all of that, we construct explanations. So Walsh said, uh, when we're thinking about explanations, we're looking for certain dominant concepts or leading ideas by which to illuminate facts, to trace connections between those ideas themselves, and then to show how the detailed facts become intelligible in the light of them. So one way we can construct explanations as historians is to provide overarching concepts and themes and big ideas and then relate individual incidents or facts of those big ideas so that we can help people see overarching patterns. Hempel says something slightly different. He says historical explanation is aimed at showing that the event in question was not a matter of chance but was to be expected in view of certain antecedents. So for Hempel explanation is just about explaining how and why events happen when they do and helping to bring that kind of analytical lens to um, historical accounts. So to summarise, I just want to make these points really, that um, history serves a number of social purposes. It's used in a number of different ways for different ends. History as a discipline is constructed using a number of different approaches. So there are some skills and there are some attitudes and there are some concepts that we can appropriate in order to become better at doing and understanding history. But within that, um, it's debatable and it's developing. So there are differences of opinion about um, how you construct a narrative and the role of narrative, how far you should tell stories and how far you should provide conceptual accounts. There are differences of opinion about whether the historian should attempt some form of neutrality or should just say up front what their ideological uh, stance is in relation to the issue that they're studying in history. Um, and of course, with the postmodern turn in all of social sciences, uh, there's a huge debate about the extent to which any form of objectivity is possible. Um, and maybe the final point just to make, to make sure this is crystal clear, because this will have implications for us when we move on to think about history teaching, is history can be viewed both as a form of knowledge and as a way of constructing knowledge. And so that really sets the scene for the second part of the introductory lecture, where we start to think in a bit more detail about what does all of this mean for history teaching and what are the traditions in, of history in schools? Uh, as a final note, uh, lots of the quotations that I've used in this lecture are drawn from other books. So um, these are the references that I've used. Um, if there's any particular um, quotation that you're interested in pursuing, let me know and I can um, send you the, the book that uh, that was drawn from. But in the meantime, this is a good kind of set of background reading text if you want to pursue any of these slightly deeper issues around the nature of history before you move on. None of it essential reading. This is just about setting the scene and helping you to think um, a bit more deeply about what it is we're going to embark on over the next few lectures.